Good evening. I'm Nima Rajan, and this is Forum Daily for Friday, October 28th. We begin tonight with a look at the Canadian economy, which is continuing its modest growth, gaining 0.1 percent in August. Statistics Canada says GDP growth in services producing industries was offset by a decline in goods producing industries. The construction sector contracted for the fifth consecutive month. The latest data comes as worries of a looming recession grow in response to rapidly rising interest rates this year. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Christia Freeland is poised to deliver an update on federal finances in the release of the fall economic statement on November 3rd. The fiscal update will also share the government's outlook for the economy. This comes as it works to anticipate the effects of high inflation and a potential recession in the coming months. Monthly updates from the Finance Department have shown that federal finances have been improving because revenues have risen and pandemic spending has wound down. Well, some big news coming out of Ottawa, which is going to be hiring a third-party company to run the claims process for its new dental care insurance program. Health Department officials say they'll be looking for a company with experience in dental insurance claims. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has said he wants to see the dental program in place by the end of 2023. This is one of the conditions of the confidence and supply agreement between the Liberals and NDP. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says Canada is imposing sanctions on 35 more Russians. It's also issuing bonds that individuals can buy to support the Ukrainian government. The five-year Ukraine sovereignty bonds are to be offered to investors through Canadian banks. And the money is to be channeled directly to Ukraine through the International Monetary Fund. The Prime Minister is in Winnipeg, where the Congress of Ukraine Canadians is holding a three-day meeting. A group of advocates is calling on the federal government to remove the limit on applications to sponsor Afghan refugees. Northern Lights Canada is asking the government to remove the limit on applications or to, at minimum, stop counting rejected applications in the total. Ottawa committed to resettling a total of 40,000 Afghan refugees after the Taliban took over Afghanistan last year. All right, well, back in the nation's capital, Ottawa's former police chief testified today at the public inquiry into the federal government's use of the Emergencies Act. Peter Slowly says there is no doubt that the force could have done better in handling and responding to intelligence regarding the so-called Freedom Convoy protest. He also testified that he feels he acted as best as he could in the situation. Mr. Slowly resigned the day after the act was invoked in mid-February. This was amid widespread criticism of his handling of the Ottawa protest. Canada's top court says parts of the National Sex Offender Registry are unconstitutional. In a ruling this morning, the court says mandatory registration of all sex offenders with more than one conviction goes too far. It also concludes that keeping all offenders on the registry for the rest of their lives violates the Constitution. The ruling came in the case of an Edmonton man who was 19 when he was brought to a party and sexually touched two women. The party was publicized by an explicit ad on Facebook. The Federal Cybersecurity Center says criminals are using new techniques to hold data ransom. The center says cyber criminals are using tactics which include threatening a target's partners or clients in order to increase their chances of receiving payment. The Canadian Center for Cybersecurity points to its threat forecast for 2023 to 2024, which predicts that cyber crime will continue to be the online activity most likely to affect Canadians and their organizations. All right, well, on the East Coast, a commissioning ceremony was held today in Halifax for the Royal Canadian Navy's second Arctic and offshore patrol ship. HMCS Margaret Brook was built by Irving Shipbuilding at the Halifax shipyard. The company has a contract to build a total of six of these patrol ships. All right, well, meanwhile, the Royal Canadian Legion kicks off its national poppy campaign with more than 27,000 traditional poppy boxes at locations across the country. Canadians can donate cash and receive a poppy pin in the lead-up to Remembrance Day, this with organizers introducing some new initiatives such as environmentally friendly biodegradable poppies. The annual push to honor fallen soldiers is set to run until Remembrance Day. 
All right, Forum Daily will be right back after the break. And when we return, we're going to have a look at gas prices with GasWizard.ca. So stay with us. Forum Daily will be right back after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. It is now time for Forum Daily's weekly energy update with Dan McTeague, Senior Petroleum Analyst at GasWizard.ca. Take it away. Well, thank you for that, Nima. And uh, what a weird week it's been. Another roller coaster ride on the energy markets. Uh, most people in Canada are reeling from what is, uh, you know, a pretty significant increase in places like Ontario and uh, Quebec, a 20 cent increase by Saturday. So tomorrow we could see prices in places like Ontario hit $1.81, uh, Montreal $1.97, same for Quebec City. The Maritimes are going to have to play catch up, of course, uh, because of these large increases. Uh, they're likely to see in Newfoundland, for instance, uh, prices move to the dollar uh, to the dollar ninety range for gasoline. And of course, uh, a little bit less for Nova Scotia and New Brunswick PEI. As for the prairies, uh, it looks like they're still staying pretty much range bound between a dollar seventy and a dollar eighty five. Uh, but uh, just as we're looking at these prices making these increases, we're also looking at pressures on the market pushing down those prices. I'll get to that in just a moment. But Vancouver, of course, now in you know back up above two dollars a liter, uh, with Victoria not far behind at two hundred four, two hundred five. Uh, the rest of the province hasn't really seen much of a change in in British Columbia. We're still you know, between a dollar eighty and a dollar ninety uh, a liter. I'm not expecting much of a change there, but I am looking and sensing that markets are really in a bit of a frustrated position. Uh, they have been finally looking at fundamentals, supply and demand, and they realize that as we're heading closer to winter, demand for oil, uh, heating products, oil furnace oil, diesel, jet fuel, and the like are going to continue to see upward pressure at precisely a time, especially in the eastern part of the North American continent. So U.S. East Coast, uh, Canadian West uh, East Coast, uh, you're going to see a bit of a shortage in heating fuels. And that could lead to uh, worst case scenario, not only high spiking prices, but potentially rationing uh, of uh, those prices uh, of those products. We'll have to wait and see where it is. But one thing's pretty clear. Uh, I think uh, some are starting to wake up to the idea that the federal government taxing uh, heating oil is not exactly uh, a very savory policy. In fact, it's one that is just downright mean spirited. And no matter how you try to cake it or uh, blend it with the idea that somehow it's all good for the climate, I think most reasonable Canadians are concluding very quickly that a tax that prevents them from staying warm in the winter is in no way, shape or form going to stop the intensity of a hurricane, uh, whether it's now or 10 years from now. But that aside, I think there is a, a growing concern and recognition in Canada that not only is this badly and adversely impacting Canadians, driving up inflation, reducing our purchasing power, destroying the value of the Canadian dollar, it is also at the same time uh, forcefully going to remind the Minister of Finance, uh, Christia Freeland, that uh, things are not as well as they thought it would be and that we are heading towards a recession. Much of that created by our obsession with green energy. Green energy, which is both unreliable, uh, certainly doesn't have the ability to be done without massive fat tax subsidies from consumers, and uh, for which I think our friends in Europe uh, are probably the best ones to explain that after trillions of dollars invested there, it's not worth and not worth pursuing. The intention may be right, but the effect is absolutely wrong. And now with uh, countries like throughout Europe, Germany in particular, having to reopen coal plants, one has to ask what the question, what the answer will be when countries like Canada, with very large provable reserves, have spent a considerable amount of their time navel gazing and saying no to getting natural gas to other markets, no to pipelines to get our much cleaner slate of oil. And by the way, an oil that's needed now more than ever, because you can't make diesel out of tight, light shale oil in the United States. You make it out of heavy oil, and there's only one country that stands amongst uh, many that can and should be producing and providing, that's Canada. So I think we're seeing a bit of a change in the political climate in this country because of economic necessity. And so the recession, uh, the uh, lack of purchasing power, the uh, higher price for energy leading now to higher prices for foods, as we had predicted here uh, last year, I think is going to force a lot of uh, politicians in this country, those who want to remain, 
uh, to maybe change their tune, get real, and uh, as it were, wake up and smell the proverbial coffee. Well, Nima, that's it for this week. For the next week, I'm expecting a bit of a turbulence in the market, down a little bit on Sunday. We could see a seven or eight cent decrease across the country, but right back up to where we're uh, seeing today, average prices across Canada, about a buck 75 to a buck 80. And uh, we'll have more for you this time next week. Back to you, Nima. Well, as always, lots to keep our eyes on. Thanks again for that, Dan. Again, that was Dan McTeague, Senior Petroleum Analyst at GasWizard.ca. He is also the President of Canadians for Affordable Energy. Stay with us. We'll be right back after a short break. And when we return, we're going to be having our weekly crypto and digital asset update with Catherine Murray, host of The Buck Stops here. And of course, we'll have more news from around the world after that. So stay tuned. Welcome back. Up now, we have Forum Daily's crypto and digital asset update with Catherine Murray. Catherine is the host of The Buck Stops Here, and she joins us now. Take it away, Catherine. Thanks, Nima. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your weekly crypto and digital asset update. I'm Catherine Murray. Well, crypto has found some stability this week alongside the North American equity markets, which are also rallying. Uh, Bitcoin is up by about 8% week over week, above $20,000. But do recall, it's down by about 70% from its high of $69,000 last year. Market cap for all of the cryptocurrency stands at about $980 billion. That is down, of course, from over $2 trillion. In terms of the developments that we're seeing on the institutional front, Fidelity, they have a survey out, and they have found that 74% of institutional investors plan to buy crypto in the future, and that 58% of institutional investors were invested in digital assets in the first half of 2022. That's actually up by about 6% year over year. The survey, though, however, I want to point out, was done in June. And, of course, we've seen the prices of cryptocurrencies continue to decline from that standpoint. Uh, also, importantly, as it relates to the survey, you always have to ask, how many people did the survey? Uh, well, over 1,000 in Europe, Asia, as well as Europe combined. In terms of uh, continued developments from a corporate perspective, JP Morgan announced uh, that Web3 digital assets and a wallet solution is under development. Um, this would actually allow clients and users total control over the digital credentials, really to be able to prove who they are from wherever they are. Uh, remember, this is one of the key reasons to be entering the space, to, to be able to have your identity associated on a blockchain perspective with your various assets. Um, it's likely going to be done on their uh, Onyx blockchain, which is the bank's platform that's been allowing users to, to trade value. Uh, globally, we're keeping our eyes, of course, on Israel. Um, the stock exchange there announced their five-year plan, strategic plan, that includes a platform for venturing into crypto. Um, they also announced that it would uh, assist uh, the Ministry of Finance in terms of uh, launching blockchain-based government bonds. Um, bringing politics into the mix here, it's also viewed right now that in the UK, the current prime minister um, is viewed as friendly towards cryptocurrencies. Recall that the UK has actually been a bit of a difficult place to create or build crypto firms. Instead, people have moved more to Singapore as well as Switzerland. Uh, and of course, the UK is such a large financial hub for traditional uh, assets, but it does appear from the proponents of cryptocurrencies that the current prime minister uh, will be more friendly to the development of companies there. Um, speaking of hubs, Hong Kong, interestingly, plans to legalize crypto trading with a goal to become one of the top uh, areas uh, within the region for digital assets. It's quite a departure from what we've seen in the past and, and certainly very different from what we see on mainland, mainland China, uh, where crypto trading is banned. Um, away from that, uh, we know that uh, today Elon Musk owns Twitter. And with that, it's interesting because he's actually been very positive on Dogecoin in the past. And Dogecoin has been up in terms of its overall value by about 35% over the past week alone. Um, just to kind of give you a bit of perspective here, in the past, uh, he has described Doge as um, uh, one of his favorite cryptocurrencies. 
In April of 2019, he tweeted that it might be, in fact, his favorite cryptocurrency. He also said in April of 2021 in a tweet that SpaceX is going to put a literal Dogecoin on the literal moon. Um, that tweet was actually followed by news that SpaceX was going to launch a satellite that would be called Doge One. How that might relate to Twitter? Well, he has revealed in relying on Doge to limit spam and limit the amount of bots on the Twitter platform. Nima, a lot to go on with uh, as it relates to what's moving in the space. That is for sure. There's just so many news items, but I'll leave it there. Uh, back to you. Sounds like lots going on, Catherine. Thanks for that. Again, that was Catherine Murray, host of The Buck Stops here. It airs on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern only on the News Forum Network. All right, stay tuned. Forum Daily will be right back. And after the break, we're going to have a look at the major news stories and headlines from around the world. Russia continues to batter Ukraine. Almost 100,000 people have been forced to flee their homes in Haiti amid gang violence. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband was beaten in his own home. And eight Vancouver restaurants are awarded a Michelin star. We'll have these stories and more news from around the world shortly after the break, so stay tuned. Ukraine's presidential office says at least four civilians have been killed and 10 others wounded in the latest Russian attacks. A statement released this morning says Russian troops fired on several towns facing the Russia-occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The shelling damaged buildings and infrastructure, and thousands of people have lost power. The UN's International Organization for Migration says gang violence has forced some 96,000 people to flee their homes in Haiti's capital. It comes as the country faces a crisis that has prompted the government to request foreign troops. The IOM said Friday that gang-related violence has led to racketeering, kidnappings and wider criminal acts. This comes at a time of deep inequality, poverty and a lack of security. Gangs are believed to control some 60 percent of Port-au-Prince. They are fighting to control more territory in the wake of the July 2021 assassination of the president. Some shocking news coming out of the U.S. where House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says her husband Paul Pelosi was attacked and severely beaten with a hammer during a home invasion in San Francisco. 82-year-old Paul Pelosi suffered blunt force trauma to his head and body. He is expected to make a full recovery. The intruder, who is in custody, was searching for Miss Pelosi, shouting, where is Nancy, before attacking her husband. All right, moving to the Philippines, where officials say at least 42 people have died and 16 others are missing. This comes after flash floods and landslides were set off by torrential rains that swamped the province of Maguindano overnight. The heavy rains were caused by tropical storm Nalgi, which forecasters expect to slam into the country's eastern coast on Saturday. Turning to Hawaii, where officials are warning residents that the world's largest active volcano, Mauna Loa, is sending signals that it may erupt. According to scientists, an eruption isn't imminent, but they are on alert because of a recent spike in earthquakes at the volcano's summit. Experts say it would just take a few hours for lava to reach homes that are closest to the vents of the volcano, which last erupted in 1984. Well, looks like the COVID-19 pandemic that shuttered classrooms for parts of two years set back learning in some U.S. school systems by more than a year. A district-by-district district analysis of test scores shared with the Associated Press finds that the average student lost half a school year of learning in math and more than a quarter of a school year in reading. School children in high-poverty areas were affected most. The students in Memphis, Tennessee, lost the equivalent of 70 percent of a school year in reading and more than a year in math. Billionaire Tesla CEO Elon Musk has taken control of Twitter, but it's still unclear what he will do with the social media platform. The New York Stock Exchange suspended trading in the company's stock today. The takeover means that Twitter is being taken private. And a filing with securities regulators shows that the shares will be delisted on November 8th. Two people familiar with the deal say Mr. Musk has already ousted three top Twitter executives. Such a shakeup was widely expected, but Mr. Musk has otherwise made contradictory statements about his vision for the company. 
Lawmakers in the European Union have reached a deal to ban the sale of combustion cars and vans by 2035. The deal is the first agreement of the bloc's Fit for 55 package, which aims to uphold the goal of cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 55 percent before the end of the decade. Under the deal, car makers will be required to reduce the emissions of new cars by 100 percent by 2035. According to EU data, transportation is the only sector in which greenhouse gas emissions have increased in the past three decades. While millions are at stake in retail sales for this year's World Cup in Qatar, and soccer fans have been playing Rate the Shirt. Well, there's no runaway winner this year, like Nigeria's jerseys in 2018, which sold out in minutes, but that hasn't slowed the smack talk about jersey designs. The U.S. kits are taking heat, and the lack of new shirts for Canada has some fans and players disappointed. Canada hasn't made it to the tournament in 36 years. The World Cup begins on November 20th. Eight Vancouver restaurants have been deemed worthy of a coveted culinary star by the Michelin Guide. A gala last night revealed the city's first Michelin list. Michelin's Vancouver Guide follows a Toronto-focused list in September, which minted Canada's first two-star restaurant and bestowed single stars on a dozen eateries. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for more news on demand, you can always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and make sure to follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Take care, Canada, and have a great weekend.